Welcome everyone to the Heber City Candidate Forum sponsored by the Wasatch Wave and Wasatch Taxpayers Association. I'm Tracy Taylor, that's Lori Wynn with Wasatch Wave and we welcome you all tonight. Uh, we're going to start with the two mayoral candidates and we're going to ask each one to introduce themselves, give us a little bit of information and a website, any information that people can go. Colleen, would you like to start, please? Sure. Do you want us to stand up, or are you gonna, I guess you kind of have it at this level. That's so. good. Okay, oh, yeah. all right. So my name is Kelleen Potter, and I actually am from Ogden, Utah. Lived in quite a few places, but I've been in Heber for about 12 years now. And I'm married to Sean Potter, and I have five kids from ages 10 to 20. And I went to BYU and studied political science and history, and I taught government in high school for a few years until Mike Levitt was elected governor, and they recruited me to come and be the director of elections for the state of Utah, where I worked with candidates and political parties and ballots and all aspects of the election process for a few years. And then most recently, I'm teaching govern a government class at the Wasatch campus at UVU. I uh, recently completed a master's degree in public administration. And I am excited to be here tonight and talk about some of the issues our city is facing. My website is potterformayor.com. And feel free to call me on my cell phone. It's 435-709-1021. Um, my website also has an email. So feel free to contact me anytime for, with questions about this evening or other issues for the city. Um, the reason I'm running, I was driving down 2nd South one day with my 10-year-old daughter, and she said, Mom, do you know what I love about Heber? And at the time, I was on the city council, and she said, I said, no, what do you love about Heber? And she said, it's not all crammed up with buildings like some of those other cities. And, and I thought, there's something special about Heber. Everybody I talk to when they say, you know, we'll go to these com conferences with other cities and tell them where we live, and everybody says, oh, you're so lucky I want to live in Heber. But Heber is at a huge crossroads right now. We have so much pressure from growth because we've been discovered. A lot of people want to live here. And there's some huge decisions that are going to be made in the next few years about the, what Heber's going to look like in 10 years and 20 years and, and, and in the future. Um, I've loved my time on the city council and feel like I have the skill set to help communicate and reach out to the community to make sure that we're making the right decisions for the future of Heber City. Alan? Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Alan McDonald, the current mayor of Heber City. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight and be able to talk to you in this open candidate forum. I've kind of been looking forward to this. It's almost looked like as many people get a city council meeting, so <laughs> anyway. Uh, I've been on the city council for four years. I've been the mayor almost the past four years also with it. Usually some of the questions I get asked as being in the mayor sometimes is some people ask me, why are so many people moving to Heber, be part of it. And usually a bunch of basic good answers you can usually give people and tell them about it. And I usually tell them about the beautiful mountain ranges we have going through the valleys to the big tall buildings that have it. And I said, nice, you can look up the skies and see without seeing the smog and the fog that's going on around with it. But one of the other reasons I tell people they come to Heber, I said, there's a secret, and I said, it's the water. We have the best taste of water in the whole state of Utah. But the real most important reason I think why people move and come to Heber is the people themselves. I continue to see people reinvest themselves back in their community by giving their time, their talent, their resources, their money into our city. I see volunteers who help our senior citizens. I see volunteers who help in our youth programs. I see volunteers that help out with our school programs and helping education of our children with that. But probably the most important thing I see people is when they <coughs> reinvest their time back in, in the community and, and being volunteers with it. This last week I had an opportunity, I had some Latinos in the Valley ask me what I could do to help them out, provide some opportunity, provide some uh, resources to be able to put donations into the, some of Mexico and Puerto Rico. So we opened our house up to opportunity to do so. We had a lot of Latinos that helped out in that end it with it. If you look at uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm running for mayor onto it, I think there's a lot of reasons you can probably put down for it. I, I love this community. I've invested myself back in, in the community with it too. I love that people were in here. I believe in protecting people's rights and I believe in also protecting people's, make sure their freedoms are put in place. And that's part of, I think, as a mayor's responsibility is to make sure when the city council have an opportunity to vote on certain things that you're watching for the people to make sure the rights and privileges are, are being protected with it. I have a website, it's called Allen, and then the number four, fourmayor.com, you can look at into it. 
the next couple of years, I see some major issues we have in front of the city. We have challenges now. There always will be those issues and challenges we have to face to look at. But my experience on the city council as being the mayor in the last uh, eight years provides the leadership I have with that to be able to be able to provide the information back to the community and be able to do so. On to, I've had 37 years of experience of running my own business with my cabinet shop and McDonald Cabinet Company with it. On to it. And that, to me, provides experience that you cannot do. Many people here are self-employed. I know how the process, uh, the difficulty of putting the business together and working, communicating with your employees. You've got your clients to deal with. You've got uh, contracts. You've also got to be able to make sure you're financially set in the, an opportunity you make choices when you spend $110,000 or $50,000 city's money, make sure you're responsible for that money and what you're able to, what you're going to do and make sure what you're getting back when you spend that money, what's the end product I'm going to have with it. I feel like I've been very conservative on my end as, as a member of city council and as the mayor of Huber City. On it. I have a lovely wife, Carolyn. And I have four children. I've, I've lived in this valley my whole life. I have 60 years experience of knowing what this valley's been like, what this town like. People talk to me and say, why don't you preserve the heritage of Heber City? And that's what I've been trying to do all that in my life. Because I am part of that heritage of Heber City because I've lived those, that part of it. It's important to preserve that heritage, but also important to look and plan in the future where Heber's going with it. So, a little bit of induction. Great, thank you. Um, very briefly, can you, Alan, start and explain to the public really what the job description of the mayor is? What actually does the mayor have control over and where you think the mayor needs to have vision? I like that question because the job description says part-time job. <laughs> well, throw that away. I, I sometimes I spend much time, sometimes I feel like full-time employees, but that's part of the job, and I've taken that responsibility to do so. I was on the city council. I spent a lot of time in the city council investigating, looking at things, and make sure when agenda items come, I had full information and understanding those agenda items with it. But the role, you have two roles. You have a legislative body of the city, and you have the administration part of the city. I'm now in part of the administration part of the city. When the city council takes a vote and makes an action move forward with it, then it comes on my part of administration, the city manager, and the city staff to be able to work through that. I work, part of my role as a mayor is when the council has an agenda on the Thursdays of the month with that. I sit down with staff and we go through the item in particular on that and go detail it out and vet it out and get all the information we can and try to provide that information to the council so they can make an intelligent and, and responsible decision. I feel like when a council member raises your hand up, you support it or not, you have to be accountable for that decision, so I want to make sure they have enough information with it. I also meet with the city staff and work with the uh, department heads. We meet regularly together on the, with the department heads. We, what we do to have accountability of all the department heads will get together. And they'll give us reporting of what they've done in the past week or what's going on and also the challenge, challenges or issues they have in front of them. And from that point on, we try to work together as a team, as a, as a staff in there with the department heads with it. When we get through with the meeting, people are held accountable for what they've been doing, what we're doing in the future with the city, and also I have a great understanding of exactly what's been going on in the city. And that's part of I never knew as part of a member of city council. You're involved in administration and a part of the city with it. Um, you have an opportunity to meet a lot of people. Uh, I get phone calls sometimes at 10 o'clock at night. Someone will say, there's a problem or situation, and I'll call department heads up and ask them what's going on. I, I love the business that come in, in the Hebrew City, but they'll want to meet with me. I'm really the public figure. They've kind of first people, person they meet with it. Uh, and they, sometimes they demand and ask a lot of things. They think the mayor has a magic wand and can just grant a lot of things to them. But there's a process you have to go through, and you have to go through that process to be able to work through the city system. Uh, the mayor has a lot of responsibilities to work at. Some people think it was just a fluff job and there's not much to it. but. Uh, it's a 24-7 job, and I'm proud of some of the things that I've done as the mayor on it and try to accomplish with it. Uh, but um, that's probably long enough for you. Great. Um, Colleen, what do you think the mayor's job would be, and how would that differ from your experience at the council? That's, um, okay, so... In our form of government, we have a weak mayor form of government. So that means the mayor doesn't get to vote unless there's a tie, which 
I can't think of it has happened since I've been on the council. I can't remember, maybe once or twice. Anyway, so um, like the mayor said, the mayor is the administrative branch of government, and the mayor's job is to work with the staff to enact the priorities and the visions of the council. And the council enacts the ordinances, and the mayor works with the staff to make sure that those things are happening and the city is functioning smoothly and people's concerns are being met and responded to. Um, the mayor conducts the meetings of the city council. I think that's a really important thing because we have a limited amount of time with the council and the staff has a limited amount of time and the, the, count, the mayor needs to help make sure that the council and the staff are focused on the priorities that have been envisioned by the council and the mayor together and the ordinances that have been enacted and to make sure those meetings are efficient and that the public is heard and that we're able to get the public's business done in public. Um, another important role I see the mayor doing is being a liaison between the between the staff and the council, between the city and the public, between the city and the school district and the city and the county. There's been a lot of concern about the relationship between the city and the other organizations in the valley. And as we see this growth and all the issues coming in the future, to be able to plan and work together, we're having issues with, you know, there's, there's a school in Daniel right on the border of Heber City. We had some issues with impact fees with the school district. I think the mayor, job is to help communicate between these different organizations to help work out some of these differences and bring them to the council to make decisions on policy. Um, and also to share that vision, to share that vision with the public and help and bring the public's vision back to the council, but to help the city residents see what the, count, what the city is doing. People are so busy, most people don't have time to come and sit in a four-hour meeting to try to figure out what's going on in the Heber City government. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have time to read 100 pages of documents, but they really care and they want to know. And I think it's the mayor's job to be the PR person for the city, to make sure that that communication is happening. Bring it to the people, come to where the people are, and help them see in, in small ways so that they can quickly see what's going on without having to try and filter through all that information while they're busy teaching our kids and coaching soccer and doing their church responsibilities. People want to know, but they cannot condense that massive amount of information. So I think it's the mayor's job to make sure that um, communication is happening with the, with the residents. Uh, along with that, I think the mayor is kind of like the chief cheerleader of Heber. I think that, you know, we want to make sure that the businesses that, you know, working with businesses that come here, working with businesses that are already here. And when people, sometimes people have misunderstandings in the businesses and they're angry at the city. I think it's the mayor's job to help communicate and smooth those things over and make sure that things are working the way they should in the city or that people understand that the city employees are just following the law and doing what they have to do. But sometimes it's just some communication that can smooth over the issues. Another really important job the mayor has in this city is to be the chair of the board of Heber Light and Power. And that is, um, that's a really important job because that is our power, public power agency for our city and there's been a, we'll probably talk about that tonight, but I think that's a, a key thing that that mayor as the chair of that board leads the direction and makes decisions on that board of Heber Light and Power. Great, thanks. Um, let's go there then, Heber Light and Power. Um, and quite honestly, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth than maybe another candidate forum would be, because there have been some discussion on Facebook. And if you're, if those citizens that aren't on Facebook, um, there's a lot, thousands of people on Facebook pages talking about some of these issues. And some of these <coughs> questions I'm asking tonight are based on some of that discussion on Facebook. So you, you kind of understand why we're discussing this. Um, it did come up in the campaign. Um, Alan, you've put some explanations up on your website about Heber Light and Power, um, how it's doing, um, but also some of the more controversial parts of Heber Light and Power and what has happened in the last four years since you've become mayor and since um, Colleen and became a city council person as well. So um, my question is, um, what have you seen happen in the last four years since you've been mayor, that you've been the chair of the Heber Light Power Board, Again, as briefly as you can, name some things that have um, been implemented since you've become chair. Okay, that's a good, good question. I like that one too. 
Hebrew Light and Power, to me, is one of the best businesses in this, this valley. It's a strong business, and it's a, it's a vital to this community, to the city itself, because it provides the power to the city. When I became the chairman of that board, there was uh, many issues that we had to face with. We had a CFO who had embezzled money. We were in lawsuits trying to work that out to it. We had a previous board member that took over $15,000 in bonus money with it. So that the company itself and the, and the vision of the people had really tainted that company as being in chaos, nothing was working, nothing was functioning down in there. We also needed to have an opportunity to work with, with this general manager. There were some opportunities to move him out. And so I wanted to make sure that when I got in there, my first position was we needed to work through the general manager. And the general manager we had, in my opinion, was doing well, but we needed to move him out. He provided an opportunity by retiring out. So we retired and we brought back into another general manager into it, which is Jason Norland with it. My point is that you have to work through that general manager. You have to work through him to get the buy-in with the general manager, the staffing, and also the people that's inv involved with that. The issues on the, the, the thing, I did make a campaign promise that when, when I got chairman of that board, I'd make sure all that money was put back in and that the prior board members in, and that was accomplished to do so. That all the money was brought back into it with it. Uh, there was a few issues we, we worked out. Uh, there were some policies we had made some changes into. We changed some of the health insurance policy, some of the retirement policy. We changed a few things with those. And the board, what do you have to understand though, it's just not me, the chairman. Yes, you're the chairman of, of the board and stuff, but you work together as a body. It's, there's six members on that body. All six work together. It's not one or two going off on their own and doing what they'd like to do or publicly put some statements out. It's probably bad business practice to do that. And what we have done as the board as itself work together as a board function because it takes the whole board to make this thing work. And we've solved the issues, I think, with a lot of the general management part. We solved the issues with the prior board. We solved the issues with the, uh, the CFO. And part of the, um, Part of the CFO situation, we hired a new CFO to work with that, but also I set up a committee, an audit committee, consists of the bottom board members, and so we put some more safeguards around the finances and expenses of the, of the company with it. That was an important key part we put into that end of it too. Uh, the issues we're facing now, we've got some agreements in place, that there's some detailed agreements working from the, the Dell, the IPA project down there. They're revitalizing that plant down there, changing from a coal plant into a gas fire plant. And there's some contracts agreements we're trying to work with with UAMs and other people on that to make sure those contracts are put in place onto it. Actually, with that plant down there going to a gas uh, <coughs> fired uh, uh, non fossil fuel, is losing 40% of its production. So it comes back on the company how are we going to replace this product? You have the federal government at this time now shutting down all the coal plants by 2025. Um, with those coal plants going down, you can see the repercussions happen to cities and stuff, but also we're looking how to replace this energy. So as a company and as a board, we've looked at it, we've added uh, solar lines, we've added windmills with it, we've looked at possibly even into a, a, some part of investing back into a nuclear plant. Uh, to, we have staff down there, we hire intelligent people down there. I don't tell them what to do because I hire them with the experience and knowledge they have what to do. They give us advice and what we need to do is the board members, the board then sits down and takes a vote of what the direction have. We just did a strategic plan this last meeting from 2018 to 2022 onto it. And we go through safety, we go through what production we have, the issues and stuff, and that strategic plan's in place and the people can label look at it. So what's important is the board works together. Again, it's not individual, not me charged. I am maybe the chairman of the board of the but also it's important I have the buy-in if the whole board works together. So those are a few things that worked out on the Hebrew Light Power. Let me ask you one thing. You brought up gas, you brought up nuclear, you, you brought up these other. Um, there's a, a larger contingency of our community now asking for solar and <coughs> uh, more sustainable power sources. What have you as a board and a staff looked into as far as converting more percentage of our power coming from renewable sources? Yeah. What well, well, a good question there too because what we've done also the board we're looking at putting uh, solar panels on the roofs out there at the at Heber Light and Power. Also could work with the county they have the, the event center onto it. So there's people who want renewable energy so we have a contract with them. If they want to buy just renewable energy, they can do that with part of the company. 
And so an opportunity, if you want solar, it, it's there to do it. You can say specifically, I want renewable, but your rate's a little bit higher because of the expense of running renewable energy through solar panels is a little more money to do so. But that's people's choice. I've, I've put, uh, I've talked to some people who have solar panels in the, in the, on the roofs. It costs them more money to run those solar panels than it does to use the coal uh, uh, products we have onto it. But they're willing to pay that. That's what they want to do. So the option's there. And what I guess I maybe I didn't explain it my question well enough, but what I'm looking at is more sources of power for Heber Light and Power. If the coal plants are shutting down, we need to get alternative sources of power. That's to why come I in. mentioned already to you. So not just to. individuals getting solar panels. I'm just letting you know. No, we bought, that there are people we're, we're, really no, concerned we have solar, about. No, we have solar fields we're investing in town. We already invested in those, and the windmills are right too. The problem about solar now is not 24-7. And so when the sun's not shining on those panels, you have to produce some type of energy <coughs> replacement where that power's not in place with it, which we have. They buy it. They, well, we produce about 50% of the product we have, and another 50 cents we go in the open market, the grid, buy blocks of power from insurance, and it saves a lot of money by doing that with it. So we're trying to be energy conscious down there. We're trying to see if people want the solar or the windmill or other objects we have. The best way to produce electric power is hydro. That's the cheapest way to get it done. On to, we have the Snake Foot plant, we have the Lake Creek plant, we get some out of Jordan now, so there's, the hydro is part of that system too. Okay. And unfortunately, uh, putting dams up anymore and running hydro, people don't like that. It's, it's a very cost-effective way to run the system okay. through hydro. Okay, great. Thanks. Colleen, um, you were on you were appointed to the Heber Light and Power Board when you first became a council person four years ago, back in 2013. Um, you were on that board for maybe six months or so. Can you explain to the public um, what investigations you did, what kind of research you tried to do with other council people? to get more information about the finances of Heber Light and Power and explain maybe some of the concerns that you felt uh, after doing some of that investigation. Sure. Um, to preface that, let me just give you a little background. I've had a few people approach me and say, I've heard that if you're elected mayor, you want to sell Heber Light and Power or get rid of it. And, that, and nothing could be further from the truth. I, my philosophy is that the government works best that's closest to the people. I think the smaller, the government is, the more re, 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 um, responsive they are. I think the employees know the people in the community. You can call Heber Light and Power and say, Jason, I mean, P I think people get good service from Heber Light and Power. And so I absolutely have never said I wanted to get rid of Heber Light and Power. I think it was very wise of our the people in this community 100 years ago to decide that we can do our own power here. We don't need to buy into some big company outside of here. Um, but the, the concern I had, and this is what happened while I was on the board, I talked to John Dougal, who was our state auditor, um, shortly after I was um, kicked off the board, and he said the problem with Heber Light and Power is they think they're a company. Mm -hmm. And the difference between a private company like Rocky Mountain Power, if they want to raise their rates, they have to go to the Public Utilities Commission, and they have to get permission to raise their rates. Well, Heber Light and Power, because it's owned by the city, Heber City and Charleston and Midway, it's a public agency, and so the board members get to make those decisions without any state authority or anybody else. Those board members get to decide whether we raise whether the rates here. And the bottom line for a private company is profitability. The bottom line for a public utility is accountability. And I went on that board with the mindset that we need to be accountable to the ratepayers. So when we, when it was time to make, we were presented with the decision that we needed to raise the rates. Well, while I was on that board, I saw a lot of the things that the mayor mentioned. There, were, there had been some, there had been some, I guess you call it embezzlement, but someone was convicted of fraud from using a credit card. I saw some excessive spending. For example, I was reading through the warrants one day and saw that they had spent $800 in one month on coffee. Well, I brought those things out because I feel like as a board member on a public, accountable agency, those are the things that I'm accountable for, to sit on that board for all the ratepayers in Heber to make sure that that money is being used wisely. And I felt like you have to be transparent. You can't be accountable if you're not transparent. So I brought those things up publicly. Um, we, I was accused by the mayor of being reckless and incompetent. And recently we received a letter from the state legislature to all board members of all the special service districts and these kind of boards. And they said, we have documented 
occurrences of fraud, waste, abuse, and poor management among Utah's special purpose entities. Well, that, though, every one of those things had happened at Heber Light and Power. They've given us a checklist of things that every one of these agencies' boards are responsible to do. And I hope Heber Light and Power's board has gone through these. Because these are things that I feel like, as a board member, um, Heidi Franco was doing these things, I was doing these things, and they weren't used to that. They were being run like a company where people don't know what's going on entirely. That was my perspective from the time I was on the board. So when I saw things that I didn't think were appropriate, I spoke out. I felt like that was my responsibility. Although I did not, um, I just lost that thought. Okay, any, anyway, it talked about how we need to look at these disbursements. We need to be not just a, a, a formal board that just comes in rubber stamps, but a board that is aware of what's going on and is asking hard questions of the staff. Uh, the board needs to hold everyone accountable to high standards of performance. The directors avoid using a compensation system and incentives that encourage employees to take risks. There were big bonuses that I hadn't seen in my experience working in government that were happening at Heber Light and Power. And, I, and to this day, you can go back and see this, the, the speech that I gave when we voted on the rate increase was that I didn't think our house was in order. And I said, government tends to overspend when they aren't forced to tighten their belts. And I said, I've seen, we've had to tighten our belts in every government agency after the recession, but I hadn't seen, the belts didn't look like they'd been tightened to Heber Light and Power, so I couldn't support a rate increase. It was shortly after that that I was kicked off the board, um, but the kind of things we had looked at were, the, the, you know, where the money was being spent, the salaries. It took a couple months to get the salary information. It took a couple more months to get the information on how they, what they based those salaries on. What was the study? What were they comparing it to? Um, Debt. I mean, if the, if the rate payers know that there's $10 million in debt and they're okay with it, that's fine because that's accountability. But I felt like that we shouldn't, oh, there were some meetings that were being held that were breaking the Public Meetings Act. So I brought that out. I said, you can't do the public's business in private. If you have a quorum, if you have so many members of the board having a meeting, you've got to do it in the public. Anyway, those were the kind of things I brought up. I felt like everything I said or did was entirely within the bounds of what four years later we're hearing from the state legislature needs to happen to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse in our government entities. Alan, did you want to... I'd like to go over that document too. Uh, we received a document as the Human Light Power Board. I specifically put that on the agenda. We went through those questions with that, with the state oh. auditor was tweeting. Yes, there's always a ways for improvement stuff, but some of most of those things in there, that the board and the companies are compliant with it. So those were already brought up in front of the, the company with it. And you have to understand a little bit about the positions of two city council members that work on Heber Light and Power. Those, the company, I'm going to call it the company, is the Heber Light and Power and the city council on it. They have separated themselves from each other. So the liability doesn't belong in the tone. And the responsibilities and the bylaws is the mayor, Heber is the chairman. He gets to appoint two people. From off that, from off the city council, that's the choice I have as the mayor. It's two, just two people, onto it. They're responsible under me, onto it. And the point of clause, the, I, the mayor of Hebrew City can let him go for reason, without reason, or without cause, onto it. The situation that uh, Miss uh, Potter is saying, I, I think she's overextended some of the things she's stating on, on what she's stating her statements with it. You have to work together as a board, and that's what we're trying to do to accomplish with it, onto it. Uh, there are some actions they took, they didn't, as part of that, the responsibility, I guess, as a board member, there's not implied authority, they're not uh, granted authority to them, they, they work for me, as I don't know, the mayor. There became situations in those board meetings that became very contentious with some of the things they're bringing up. They were accusing the staff of being not honest and not trustworthy. Uh, to me, someone who has been on the board for less than six months, it takes a while to figure out what the happening within the company itself. Yes, there were some situations and problems that we needed to look at and fix that. The board was aware of all of those. There's nothing new they brought up. We knew what was out there and what needed to be dealt with. But there's a better business practice of how to do it and then trying to whack and hack the place apart and get in front of the public and tell them this is what we're trying to do. If they come in front of the board, they could have had an opportunity present some of their ideas t to us and maybe work together as, as a board with it. But the responsibility, what they have, I was responsible for some of their actions with it. It's interesting also with that, uh, the other members of the board became very concerned some of some of the things we're saying in actions with that. And they requested, and part of the request was that it wasn't a functional board with the two of them in there, so it was an opportunity 
they said you, you need to move them off the board. Uh, we had the employees that had turned to almost out of, out of chaos with them. The morale in that company went down to almost at zero to some of the comments they were making about some of the employees. They were being accused of stuff. There was, we had the problems we had to face with the first six months. The employees then became accused, became like they were the victims of also what all was going on. They weren't the victims. They were just employees trying to work and do their job down there with it. There were just better ways to run a business doing than what they had planned to do with it. So I think there's ways to be able to make this work for us, and that's what we did. And since that point, the time, the separation, the two of them came off the board, the company and the board has very worked very well. It functions very well. Onto just is a better fit with the, with the people we have in there now than with the, the other two we had before. Let me ask you, um, on your website, you had stated that um, these council people had not um, kept their fiduciary duty to Heber Light and Power. And my question to you is, what is that? What is the fiduciary duty of the city council and all the board members um, to Heber Light and Power? What do you think that was that they violated? Well, let me ask you, what do you think it is? That's n I'm not running okay. for mayor. I'm not running for mayor, no. Well, well, well I guess to me, is, I guess, let me, let me clarify a little bit. So I'm wondering how comes the personal question coming back at to me of something that happened in the, in the past. With no, but forward. you wrote this on yeah. your website I see, I see. as part they, of your campaign. Well, I'll That's say this. That's the only reason why I'm the bringing it up. The responsibility, I said that, that same point I put on my website, put on there, I met with, with the state auditors people. They asked that question because it was in there for other reasons why some of the board members had taken pay with it. And they asked if they let him off before that. I says no. And I answered the same question to him. And he, he was acceptable with the answer I gave to him. I feel that part of responsibility is you, you owe it back to the company. You make sure the company's running well. You mean it back to the board with it. They breached those parts, those parts with, those, with doing some of the actions they had without permission from the rest of the board to be able to do so. So, do they have a fiduciary duty to the rate payers of the company. They have part of that too, but the main responsibility well, goes back to the Well, that's, I think, where yeah. this, whole play, this whole thing plays out. And to be a full disclosure here, you brought up the fact that these two city council people came to a, a public association to share some of their concerns with the public. That was the Wasatch Taxpayers Association. So I want to say that right off the bat, that that's the public association they showed up. So we have videotapes of these meetings on our website at wasatchtaxpayersassociation.com for any citizen that wants to go back and listen to these city council people and what they brought up. I just want to say that too. But let me ask you, um, there's, there's that fiduciary duty that you think might have been violated. Oh, and gosh. I actually talked to state officials to ask them what is the responsibility of any board, whether it's city council, Wasatch County, school board, Heber Light and Power, any board. Is there a responsibility for each individual board member to go to their constituents with concerns? And are they violating any fiduciary duty to the company? Let's talk about Heber Light and Power. Did they break any fiduciary duty to the company? And did they have to get the approval of the rest of the board members? That was my, that's what you brought up on your website. Do they have to get approval from the other board members to go out to the public and just share some of these concerns? They said absolutely not. There's no way a school board member isn't allowed to go talk to their constituents and say, hey, look, you know, we're thinking about building the school. I think it's a little bit too much money um, or any financial situations where they want the constituents to know about what's being spent at the school board, they have every right to go talk to their constituents without the rest of the school board giving them permission to do so. So that's my question, I guess, and, and it's kind of a contentious okay. one that no, got... I, I get to that, but you don't understand the bylaws of Heber Light and Power. Again, I said, the mayor, Heber Sear, points those two positions. They're under me. They're, they're under, I am their boss. On it. It's a different way the bylaws are set up. The state might see it that way in the other boards, but you read the bylaws of Heber Light and Power. 
their responsibility is to me, and I am accountable for them. I can do, you know, if, they, if I feel like that the responsibility is not filling that duty or the position they're having, I can let them off the board and replace them. I don't need a city council. I totally agree back. with you there. You and have every right And I feel like right it, their actions were inappropriate yeah. on it, and it, some of the actions defamed the rest of the board, even some of the board members, you know. I had the support of what not only they did, what they have. I mean, go talk to the rest of the board members there, and go talk to the employees were there. I mean, if you want more witness than just me sitting here now, no, I'm there's other chaos in there, and that's why we tried to had to solve it. That was one of the problems I didn't have to want to have to deal with, considering it was in the middle of the rest of the stuff. But eventually, we got it all worked out with it. But that's my position to stand on. Okay, and Colleen, I you wanted to rebut yeah, to some, so I do want to give you a minute. So just for the record, I um, I would challenge anyone to find something where I accuse staff of being on, dishonest or not trustworthy because I never said anything like that. And I only spoke in public at the hearing or in the board meeting. I didn't speak at that. I was at that meeting, but I can't take credit for that presentation. And so I didn't speak. Two other things. One is I feel like that situation where the mayor can appoint people without the consent. Heber City is a 75% owner in Heber Light and Power. I can't think of any other top place in government where there's not a check and balance on that. So even if I were the mayor, I would suggest that there was a uh, consent by Heber City, City 75%. Went. I think there should be more input than just the mayor, even if it were me, I would suggest that. Finally, um, the mayor said there are better ways to run a business and it was a bad business practice. And I totally agree, if it was a business, it would be better, but it can be painful when you're in government because people can see and they can criticize you and they can see what your salary is. <coughs> and that's just part of being in government. You have to be accountable. And I think it's a different ball game than running a business. And that's why. One last question on Heber Light and Power and then we'll take a break. Um, I went back a little bit, refreshing my memory. Um, when the two city council people were removed, Shortly thereafter, Blaine Stewart received a $238,000 severance package. Um, and he was the general manager at the time when Tony Furness and all the fraud happened. Okay. Um, my, uh, the two city council people wanted the city Heber City manager to do a little report back to the city council of how the company's really doing. How are, are they following their personnel policies? Are they, are they doing, is there anything the city manager was concerned about? And as Heber owns 75% of it, these council people felt they needed their city manager to go take a look. One thing he brought up was that there is no personnel policy that allows a salaried manager who voluntarily retires to get a severance package. That is against the bylaws of Heber Light and Power. But after the two city council people were removed, a $238,000 severance package was given to Blaine Stewart and I would just like you to explain how that, I'm, I'm what sure, happened. I'm sure glad you're getting everything off your ch chest, Tracy, because what you're doing is you're doing personally attacks on me. This not being a fair forum. Yes, there's answers you being had, but all you've done is, is me, me, just point your questions at me. So we I think haven't you're, you're, gotten you're, to other No, I'm saying you're being tonight. unfair as a moderator. You're not really getting down the issue we want to talk about. But the other thing I want to talk about, too, is that the opportunity to let Blaine opened up with us to do so. He, he had $185,000 coming to him from his back, from his uh, sick leave, all the other vacation time. That was his onto it. To tell you the honest truth, I can't talk a lot about this. There's a part of the agreement we signed with, with Lane onto it would jeopardize me and the company with it. But part of that package or whatever it was, so the void lawsuits was into, what could have got into with him, which it was headed down that path with a little extra money, but what we did by moving him out of the way, put it, this, the company saved over $200,000. So it made an opportunity by saving some money by able to do so, by moving him out of the way with it. But the majority of that money was money he was entitled to, that from his, from his sick leave, his vacation leave, and everything else was part of those packages. That was it. I didn't put those in place. 
I just had to deal with the situation with it. And to say that we were in compliant with it, we have legal vice down there. And Mr. Dumbeck is legal vice down there. Everything we did as a board, we went through him and said, is this correctly? Are we following the bylaws? Are we doing what's supposed to be done? He said, it's correctly done. It's following the bylaws. That's, you did everything exactly what's legal it's supposed to have. So I support the documents in there because we had the legal advice, gave it to us, and says we were acceptable to do what we did with it. Okay. Colleen, do you have any rebuttal to that or anything you want to add? I, like you said, I was gone when that happened, but I just remember hearing that um, we asked him, how did this happen? How did this guy get away with this? He was spending money on his credit card, and it was your job to look over those receipts because he had to sign them. And he said he didn't look at him. And for me, right then, I thought that was enough to get rid of him. And I was advocating after that. So. Okay, actually, we're going to. Actually, before the two of them got on the board, that was the first thing I told the two council members to get on. That was one of our goals, was to remove the jail manager on with it. I'm probably going to get in trouble with Blaine Stewart, but I've said some things on it. So well, I think it'd be clear. You're, you're asking questions. I'm saying that it's, it's jeopardizing me, probably legally, what I'm saying to you tonight. It's in the, well, I, that was not my intent. I think that, but you know, you're probing into areas issues, that I think you should have gotten into. Well, I think that ratepayers have a right to know why 238000 was spent. But I, we're going to take a short break. There's more questions here, Alan. So I hope at the end of this night you feel like it was a more fair moderated debate because well, so we're not done. Been, I just mean. don't want you to feel like no, this is so it. No, so far it's We've been attacked on me from your end of it and I don't appreciate that. Okay, thanks. We'll be right back.